Hey everybody, welcome to Build at Home, uh, once again from my home in uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn. I'm so glad that uh, you could join us, and I'm so glad right now that uh, one of my favorite writers, Don Winslow, could join us uh, here to talk about his new book, Broken, a series of novellas, some of which featuring characters that we've seen in previous novels. I think some new characters as well. Don, uh, good to see you. How, how you holding up? Good to see you, man. I'm holding up fine, you know. Look, I'm a little disappointed. You know, I was supposed to be out to 20 cities to, to go to bookstores and see mm. read, and that's always a great thing to do. You know, I feel very strongly and about both. And I'm grateful to them for all their support. So doing this virtually is the next best thing, and, and we hope it works. But I, I miss being in the building with you. You know, it was always... <laughs> Yeah, I love uh, I love cornering you in the green room and making you talk to me about uh, crime fiction and crime movies. <laughs> yeah, there was always great conversations. And as I've said, you have the best green room going and I want to steal the artwork off the wall. So uh, maybe I'll send someone in while we're all absent and do that. So if, if the artwork is missing when you get back, it was not me. <laughs> I'll ex our executive producer will be very happy to hear that compliment. Um, uh, what are you doing to uh, to stay sane, to stay... Uh, oh, actually, sorry. I, I almost forgot before we really get started. Um, I, I have to say that um, 505 million school lunches have, uh, have, have not been given to children in the country due to the school closures because of the coronavirus. If you are watching and you would like to help, please go to nokidhungry.org uh, where you can find out how you can donate, how you can be a part of helping these children get some of these uh, meals back um on that note don how are you uh how are you oh, go ahead yeah got it oh you wrote it down oh that's great no kid .org. yeah um how are you uh how are you staying sane during your lockdown during your quarantine are you getting a lot of writing done or are you finding it hard to focus here's the sad thing okay for a writer the lockdown is not that much different from real life <laughs> you know it's like i I spend all day alone anyway, you know, writing and making stories up and that kind of thing. So it hasn't been that different. Uh, but yeah, I'd, I've been watching a lot more DVDs, uh, reading more, all of that kind of stuff. You know, I think that everyone's doing. Do you find it, are you finding it uh, harder to focus with everything that's going on? Not really. You know, look, right now I'm on this book tour, so it's a virtual tour. So I'm doing a lot of interviews and things. So that, you know, that's different from my normal writing day. I'm still writing, you know, in between interviews and, and when I have a chance to do it. But no, you know, I'm not finding it hard to focus. I think, look, these are, this is uncharted territory for everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody's anxious and concerned. And for me, you know, the, the solution to, to that at any time has always been to write. That's what I do, and, and that's where I, I think I find the most sort of solace, you know, to the extent that I need it. You know, reading uh, the new book, I can't help but think that this was a bit of, while you were finishing maybe The Cartel, this was the other book that you were working on that gave you a little bit of a release from the sort of, ref, uh, these sort of references and the, uh, the research that you had to do for, for The Cartel. Is that true at all? To some extent, I think like the middle three stories in here that are all set around San Diego mm -hmm. are stories that I've had in mind for quite a while, including when I was wow. writing Bell and Border and Force and some of the kind of heavier kinds of works. And then after I finished Border, then I, I wow. had the time to say, well, let me go back to those stories because I knew that they weren't epics. You know, they, they were in one spot and over the course of days rather than decades, but they were more substantive than would fit into a short story. And so this gave me the time to explore that novella format uh, and see how that worked out for these stories. How did you know that they were only going to be in one spot, that they weren't going to be expansive? How Do you know that early on when you set in on the first page? that this is really just gonna be one one succinct little story or is that after a little while of tinkering with it, you figure it out? Yeah, it's after a little while. You know, some of these again, have been in my head for quite a while. So in those cases I knew, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I, I just wanna set this around Highway 101. I, I just wanna set this in Kauai. Uh, this is a New Orleans story. Mm. So in my mind, they were already kind of not contracted. That's the wrong word, but but more specific, you know, more focused on one place. What made you want to? New Orleans is, um, 
you know, my favorite city uh, in America. I love it so much. Uh, I'm heartbroken with what's happening there right now, as I am with what's happening in New York City. But what made you want to tell a story about New Orleans? Heritage. Uh, my mom's from New Orleans. Uh, my grandparents for, from New Orleans. My, my grandmother was a, a war healer for Huey Long. Mm. Uh, depression. So I grew up down there a little bit. My dad was a sailor, and when he'd go off on long voyages, we would go down with my mom uh, to the family in New Orleans, or as a family, we'd go down there on vacations. I, I was at a lot of Mardi Gras as a child. And so it was good to go back there, at least mentally, and set a story there. Did you feel like you, did you go back there at all to write it? Because the locations are so specific and, and, and spot on. It's, it's hard to believe that you were able to recall all of those from memory. Uh, I didn't, so I had to do research. I did not get to go down there on this specifically, you know, so it was just a matter of kind of keeping up. Uh, you know, the, the locations of our memories are always different than real locations, aren't they? And I think that, that can be a good thing and a bad thing. So you have to recheck it for accuracy. At the same time, you want to maintain that feeling that led you to write the story in the first place. And I have such vivid feelings about that city and about certain places uh, and being there because it has such strong kind of, you know, resonance with me. Your three stories uh, in the center that are basically the centerpiece of, of all of these stories, the three novellas in the center, all take place around San Diego, as you said, and feature a cast of reoccurring characters, but each one with a different character that, uh, at the center of it. And each story is dedicated to, I think, a, a hero of yours. We have Steve McQueen, we have Elmore Leonard, and... Raymond Chandler. Now, upon reading these stories, I was myself hunting for the very direct, clear influence of Elmore Leonard, or very yeah. clear, direct influence of Raymond Chandler. McQueen is referenced in, in, in his story, but what uh, were they even there for you within these stories, or was it just people no. that you wanted to write to? No, no, they were very much there in each story. You know, when I got thinking about a story called Crime 101, which is the one dedicated to, to, to McQueen, uh, I just had this idea about this culture that was around that highway and that was around cars. And I think that Steve McQueen defined that for us back in the 60s and 70s, cr almost created a cultural biome that I write a lot about. And so I thought, hey, what would happen if I had a character driving up and down the 101 who was very aware of McQueen's heritage to the extent that he models himself after the McQueen that he knew in film. In the second story, which is called the San Diego Zoo, you know, which starts with a chimp uh, with a revolver, I wanted that Elmore Leonard quirkiness, mm -hmm. you know, where, where you take a story and you knock it off true north a little bit. And, and write it that way. With the third story, Sunset, uh, if you go and look at, at Chandler's The Long Goodbye, you're gonna see uh, direct references, direct little homages to it oh, in wow. the story. And uh, last year, I got to go to Chandler's house. Now, I, I always love to taunt my Los Angeles friends that Raymond Chandler wrote his great Los Angeles novels from San Diego. <laughs> Because uh, I'm a local San Diego honk, you know, uh, but I got to go to his house. I got to go into the room where Raymond Chandler wrote The Long Goodbye. It was like going to church. And in the bathroom of that house, when you look on the walls, there are still the bullet holes where a drunk Chandler tried to shoot his wife. And fortunately, <laughs> <laughs> um, back in the second story that you referenced, the Elmer Leonard one, I will say, now that I think of it, the, the reference that I picked up on was the criminal, the sort of main criminal of that story is comically stupid and, yeah. and a motor mouth, if you will, which is very El, 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 Elmore Leonard. Very Elmore Leonard. You know, when I was writing that, that bad guy, I, I think his name is Hollis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I definitely had some of the Leonard bad guys in mind, you know, I mean, he, listen, he wrote some ferociously scary bad guys as well, but he wrote some funny, again, quirky, off the wall, offbeat bad guys. And that's what I was trying to emulate. Is that something that you have found? I mean, was that a stretch for you? Because I think most people know you from at this point in your career from the force or the, um, the, sort, the sort of cartel series that you put together, all of which are these 
that are very serious epics about about crime. Whereas this is, like you said, it's it's kind of quirky. It's 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 offbeat. Was that something that came naturally for you, or was a bit of a stretch? No, I think it does come naturally to me. You know, prior to the big drug books, and even between them, I wrote some quirkier novels. Some of the characters appear in these: Boone Daniels, the surfer, and you know his cast characters and some other quirky kinds of things you know i i feel that i always want to have the freedom how do i put this to play the tunes i want to play right you know uh I, jazz for instance occupies a major part of a story in this called sunset and sometimes i I liken jazz to writing in the sense that, yeah, you know, you can play like hard bop. You know what I mean? You can play those fast, tough, hard driven songs at the same time. Hopefully you can play ballads, you know, uh, and I and I think that that we should have the right to do that. You also bring uh, Ben and Sean back from from Savages with with a story. What made you want to return to, to those characters? Yeah, because I like them so much. <laughs> This is basically it. Uh, you know, listen, they're problematic because at the end of a book called Savages, they die, uh, mm -hmm. Oliver notwithstanding. And so uh, anytime I write about Ben, Sean, and O, you know, the principal female character there, I have to go back in time. Uh, and in this case, I went back in time and I realized, hmm, you know, Winslow, uh, I don't want to be too, too specific here, but you left a couple of characters from your other books in that place. Uh -huh. And so when I went back and did the math, I went, wow, Ben and Sean and O are going to be there at the same time as Bobby Z. And how old would Bobby Z's kid be now? And ah, what would happen if I threw them together? And, you know, we found out. I hope it worked. I feel like you are incredible at writing uh, action climaxes both with uh, Broken and with Ben and Chan's story. Um, what is it, how do, you, how do you craft those? How do you set those up? Are you just writing from beginning to end or are you thinking about you know, where this can go, how this can happen and, and sort of crafting it on a, on a board of some kind with notes? Yeah. No, I never do that. I never, I never board it out. I never write outlines. Well, rarely, every once in a while with the more complicated drug books, I'll have a very rough sort of outline of here are the broad moves. Uh, but with this, these stories, no, I wrote them beginning to end. Uh, and I didn't know what was going to happen, to tell you the truth. Now, with the action sequences that you kindly alluded to, uh, that's a matter of rewriting. Mm -hmm. I think with action sequences, for me, it's different for everyone, of course. But uh, for me, it's a matter of writing them on the first draft very fast, like the action's just happening in real time. Do you know what I mean? Ba 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 then when I have it down, then I take another, you know, or several really hard looks at it. And then it's a matter of crafting it literally down to the syllable level to get the right rhythms and the right beats. And by the way, the right moments of silence in them. Right. And figuring out how each, because usually the way, the way that your action sequences are working, there's multiple people involved in those sequences. And I mean, at least with, with Broken and with the, the Ben and Sean story, forgive me for not remembering the exact title of that story. Uh, but, paradise. Yes, paradise. Uh, where you have multiple characters involved in different shootouts or versions or, or aspects of this sequence, so you're cutting back and forth. Yeah, yeah, and that really is a matter of that, you know. And it's it's a matter. I mean, maybe we're getting too technical here, so stop me. But it's a matter of point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, I write in what someone told me. I'd never heard the phrase before. The close third person point of view, in which. Um, I always try to see the action through the character's eyes, but not writing it in the first person voice, writing it in the third person. So when I'm writing it, I'm seeing that action through that character's eyes, you know, and it's happening in real time. And I usually write also in the present tense. So it's not like you're looking down at a table, for instance, and things are laid out sequentially. You're looking at something that is vertically in your face, right? And it's happening, boom, and this happens, boom. And this happens, boom. So on the first draft, I'm writing that, and then I, I cut away. Let's go to the next guy. Let's see it through his or her viewpoint. Boom, 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 and so forth until we reach what is hopefully you know, a satisfying ending. Do you ever try to uh, 
change your third person voice into something. I mean, because it always feels to me that it is third person. Like you said, it's very close, but it's also similar to how we would imagine our character, our main character, or the sort of uh, compilation of all the characters within that story, how they would talk. That the voice of the third person is very close to the story itself or how the, who the people are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I try to do that. You know, I um, look, I have no interest whatsoever in self-expression. You know, that's that's not important. Doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is the story and the characters, not me. So when I'm writing in that third person close voice, yeah, I'm trying to match the rhythms of that character. And hopefully it does sound somewhat like their dialogue. Have you ever been interested in, in, in self-expression? Have you ever been interested in telling your story or some sort of Noah Baumbachian character? <laughs> <laughs> Look, to every once in a while. Every once in a while. I'm right right alone in San Diego having relationship problems or something. No. <laughs> no one would want to read it, you know. Uh, <laughs> been married to the same woman quite happily for coming on 35 years at the end of this month. So there's, you know, there's not a lot of story to tell there. Uh, no, every once in a while I'll write a column mm -hmm. or, or a memoir, a little piece or something. And then I'm, I guess that's self-expression. But in terms of the novels, no, absolutely not. That's not my job and no one would be interested. Who cares? You know, what, what I care about and what I think the reader cares about is the story the character, maybe some new information, you know, in some of the novels that are closer to reality that, that comes to them, that they're not interested in, in me expressing myself and I'm not interested in me expressing myself. How do you know when to break further from reality than when to stick to it? I mean, the opening story, Broken at the risk of, I don't want to spoil anything, breaks as I think, as far from reality as I think Don Winslow breaks but at the same time remains kind of grounded and makes sense within the context of the story. Yeah, again, thanks. It depends on the story. You know, when I'm writing, for instance, those, the big drug books, I, I know the story because I'm writing a fictional version of reality, right? And so I have certain touchstones. I have certain, you know, crossing that river, if you will, I have certain boulders to jump on to get across. Other pieces, though, are purely fictional. They're coming from the imagination. Now, they're all set in the real world. So you have to be, you know, realistic about that, about place and all of that kind of thing. But no, in those cases, I'm just going off my imagination and characters are just sort of appearing and doing what they do. And so, uh, you know, I'm not as concerned about, boy, there was this, you know, central event followed by this important event followed by that one. It's just to be really honest with you, just making it up as I go along. You know, when you have a character return uh, in one of these stories that is a, a, a big character in terms of uh, your books and your work, but it's a very small return. I don't want to say who it is to ruin it for fans of yours. How comfortable are you with people who haven't read that book or know who this character is reading this or getting or sort of being introduced to that character this way? Yeah, it's always a tricky issue because you don't want to assume someone's read the previous books. At the same time, you want the reader who is familiar with those books to have a really great sort of aha moment mm -hmm. and experience when, when these old characters pop up. So that's tricky. And it's a matter of, boy, you know, how much information do I give and how much do I hold back? And, and hopefully it was the right recipe. Well, for one of them in particular, in my mind, it was uh, the perfect recipe because I got it pretty, I was pretty sure who it was going to be early on. And then when it was revealed, I was like, yes. And then I think there's just like one set, like one yeah. set that says like who he is. And it's like, that's enough for someone who doesn't know. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh yeah, he's back. Good. I'm glad you had that reaction. Look, you have to be fair with the reader, you know, yeah. uh, you, you have to set it up early on so that it plays out at the end. I, I hate those stories when, you know, the guy is trapped on the skyscraper roof and hopelessly surrounded by his enemies. And then he flies and then the author tells you, oh, by the way, his mother was a bird, you know? I, I hate that moment. And so we have to set that up earlier. But again, you know, it's so tricky because you don't want to give it all away. And you just have to try to find, you know, just enough, but not too much.
you know, uh, we were talking about self-expression and how you're uninterested, you're not interested in self-expression. Um, I follow you on Twitter. I feel like you express yourself a lot on Twitter, sure. yeah. as do I. Um, uh, but you've been kind of quiet lately. Has 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 the the turn of events in the world in the past few weeks made you reflect differently or feel differently about how how you use your voice? I have to disagree with you. I don't think I've been that quiet at all. I think I've been pretty outspoken about how I feel about all this. Yeah. So I'm gonna uh, take you to task on that. I, I don't you think. Do. I... <laughs> So, uh, maybe people wish I were. That might be wish fulfillment on your part. But, uh, no, not at all. Not at all. I love your. I love your Twitter, Don. <laughs> <laughs> no, look. I think I've spoken out about about what I think about this. You know, I think I think we have a chief executive who's who's dropped the ball, and not just negligently, but selfishly, and and for all the wrong reasons, and. And as usual, other people are paying the price for that. Do you think he criminally dropped the ball? I'm not a lawyer, uh, but uh, I think that that's a distinct possibility. I, I think, look, it's it's his role and his job to be on top of this and not not to drop the ball for reasons of reelection or, or economic reasons. One of uh, you haven't been entirely quiet, excuse me, because I have one of them in the back of my head now that I think of it, which was um, after the CARES Act was introduced, the first bill that Congress was passing, you were disappointed in it, or you tweeted your disappointment in, in the sense that not enough, it, it seemed like you were saying not enough was going to people and most was going to corporations. And we just saw, I don't know, before, just before we started, I saw that Trump fired the inspector general from the Department of Justice, who was basically independent and gonna be in charge of overseeing where a fair amount of this bailout money yeah. And of course, that's just a coincidence, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Look, the, this, this administration is corrupt. There, there can no longer be a question about that. You can defend it if you want, but there can no longer be a question that this administration is corrupt, that it is incompetent, and that it is self-serving. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. Um, Don, uh, you are one of my favorite people, one of my favorite writers. Thanks. Um, I always enjoy this interview. I always look yeah. forward. Um, I always enjoy your books. Please, please keep writing. <laughs> We're going to try. Yeah. Um, good to see you. I am glad that you're healthy. I'm glad that you're safe, that you're holding up in San Diego, and that this book has been put on shelves today or internet shelves. However, people are getting books right now. Make sure that you get it. It's a, an incredible addition to the work of Don Winslow and a lot of fun to read right now. Don, good to see you. Good to see you, if only at a distance here. I hope you're standing six feet behind the microphone just in case. And, uh, <laughs> Let me back up. Let me back up. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you in person soon. Absolutely. Everybody, everybody out there, be well, be safe, okay? You too, Don. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.